Let's begin with prayer. Father God, I thank you for your amazing grace. I thank you for your love, so deep, so real. I thank you for the empty tomb and what it is. It's empty, and it's forever empty. Thank you for the truth that our Lord has risen and for the power of the cross and the beauty of the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, that song really got me. <laughs> well, 1937, uh, Ed Kiefer was a senior in the School of Engineering at the University of Toledo in Ohio. He was tall, slender, and bespeckled. Ke Kiefer was the president of the Calculus Club, the vice president of the Engineering Club, and a member of the school's exclusive all-male honor society. He also invented what is known as the Cupidoscope. The electrical device could not have been more perfectly designed to bring campus-wide fame to its creators. Kiefer and his less sociable classmate, John Hawley, it promised to reveal with scientific precision if a couple was truly in love. And as the inventors explained to the United Press, Reporter, as news of the or innovation spread, the Cupidoscope delivered on its promise in terms of called Amor Cycles, the affection that the college girl has for her boyfriend. Built in the school's physics laboratory, the Cupidoscope was fashioned from an old radio cabinet, a motor spark coil, and an electrical resistor. To test their bond, a man and a woman would, be, would grip electrodes on either side of the Cupidoscope, Cupidoscope, and move them toward one another until the woman felt a spark, not of attraction, but of electricity. And the higher her tolerance for this mild current, the more of a love signal the meter registered. And a needle decorated with hearts purported to show her devotion on a scale that ranged from no hope to see the preacher. It all sounds like a slightly painful party game, but the Cupidoscope was one experiment in a serious decades-long quest to quantify love. This undertaking garnered the attention of leading scientists across the United States and in Europe in the early years of the 20th century. And it's memorialized most prominently in the penny arcade mainstay known as the love tester. My question is, how do you measure love? Is it even possible? In the Bible, we read these words in Ephesians. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. How can you measure something that surpasses our knowledge? What tool, what measuring device, what method of invention would we ever use to grasp the limit of God's love? When I read these verses, I see such wonderful promises that God has given us. Christ seeks to dwell in your hearts through faith. He wants to live his life in you. God wants to give you his power, his love, to get an idea of how immeasurable his love it really is. We just get a glimpse of it. And it's like, whoa, that will blow your mind, just the glimpse. He wants you to have eyes to see the vast size of his love that stretches far beyond you could ever comprehend. And finally, the promise of God that gives to you and me is this to be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, to be filled, that you will be filled with God. This is the same as it was said earlier, Christ dwelling in your heart. Christ is the fullness of God. In another passage in Colossians, we read this, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. If we could measure Christ, we could measure and quantify the love of God. But his love is so grand, so vast, we will never be able to fully grasp the magnitude of his love. When we read, filled with the fullness of God, God is saying to you and me that he's filling us with himself. In Psalm 45, we read, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in his greatness is unsearchable. 
It's unsearchable, meaning it's beyond our ability fully grasp. God is too great, too grand, too wonderful, and as awesome and amazing God is, if he, want, he wants to live with you and me. He had called you to his home. He created you for you to know him of all the things he could do. And the Bible says he can do whatever he wants. He wants to live with you. And he wants you to live with him. But there's a problem, and that's our sin. Our sin keeps us from God. In Isaiah, we read, th- we read this. Behold, the Lord's hand is not short, and that it cannot save, nor is ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. In order for you and me to live with God and he with us, our sins have to be removed. They have to be forgiven. See, so he sent his son, the Lord Jesus, to this earth. He came as a baby, grew up in a forgotten town called Nazareth, where nothing good comes, according to Nathaniel. When he was 30, he began his ministry. He preached the kingdom of God. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He cast out demons. He fed the hungry. He found the lost. He touched the leper. He touched the hurting. He wiped the tears from the broken and the hurting. He led the disciples, and he showed them the ministry that God was calling them to. He led the 12. He loved them. He prayed with them. He taught them. He challenged them. He rebuked them. He warned them, and he was going to be mocked, hated, crucified. But in three days, he would rise up again. He came to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast with the 12. He was then later arrested, tried, convicted, crucified. He was placed in a, and then he, he died, and then he was placed in a borrowed tomb. He was brutally killed and humiliated. His death demonstrates the brutality of our sin, but the beauty of God's love. And his death on the cross is what we needed. But three days later, he arose. I want you to to declare today, he is risen. On the day he arose, he proved once and for all that his love and and the power of his love. When Christ died on the cross, all our sins were placed on him. He died for he took our place. He's the one who made it possible for you and me to live, that we could live with God and God with us. He is the one who took the sin. He paid the debt. Christ is the reason your sins are forgiven. Christ is the means by which we can know God, live with God, and he with us. Christ is the power of God and the power of God's love revealed to all the world. When he arose, it proved sin and death could not stop what God wants to accomplish. He defeated sin and death. He defeated the hurt and the hate. He defeated sickness and pain. He dismantled the wall that separated you from God. And he says, come on in. His love is real. His love has overcome. Do you believe God's love can overcome what you're dealing with today? The only way to know this love, his love, is for you to come before him in all humility, in repentance, confessing your sins, in repentance, accepting Christ as Lord. And the way to live in his love is submit to him, seek him, remove all your idols, read his word, pray to him, and walk with him. He is risen. What can he not do? The day Christ arose, I want to look at three things that were open. Number one, the tomb was open. In Matthew 28, start with verse 1, it says, Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he, has, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. As the Lord Jesus died hanging on the cross, the veil in the temple was torn. The Jewish leadership did not want the bodies, uh, those that were on the cross, uh, on the Sabbath day during the Passover. 
So they said they have to die and then they have to be removed. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the one man to the right of Jesus and then the legs on the, le uh, the left and the right. There you go. <laughs> and then they died because it was very difficult. for They basically suffocated. Then they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers instead pierced the side of Christ with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. After the piercing of Jesus' side, a man we never heard of before, Jer Joseph of Arimathea, went to Pilate to ask for the body that he might put Jesus in his tomb. Joseph, we've come to find out, was a secret believer in Christ. But he was afraid of the Jewish leadership. He liked his reputation. He liked the power that he had. So he said, shh, don't tell anyone that I'm a follower of Christ. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a prominent member. And he knew if he loudly proclaimed and claimed his allegiance to Christ, he would lose his seat on the Sanhedrin. So he quietly followed Jesus. Joseph took the body, laid it in his tomb. He wrapped Jesus in strips of linen. A large stone was placed as the door to the tomb, a stone that was large, large enough, and there was no intention of it ever moving. It was placed in such a way that it would even be difficult to remove. In addition to the stone, Roman soldiers were commanded to guard the grave. Well, early Sunday morning, the women came to the two wanting to anoint Jesus and put spices on his body. And as they approached the place where Jesus had been laid, they wondered among themselves, who's going to remove the stone? How are we going to get in there? And so as they, they wondered that. But as they asked that what they, about this stone, the, all of a sudden as they're walking up on the scene, they notice the tomb is open. What had happened? Before the women came to the Lord, uh, Jesus Jesus had died on the cross. His body lay in the tomb, but then something happened. Jesus got up, removed the linen clothing. He brushed the dust of death off of his body. Death gave one final reach, one final grasp, but Jesus just pushed it away. The dust of death fell to the ground. The grip of death was broken, and the hand of death shattered. He stood up. Just then an angel came down where a mighty earthquake shook the ground. What had happened was that the angel landed so hard and suddenly it just shook the earth and the stone rolled away. And the guards that were there were standing there and they just became paralyzed with fear and fell down. And Jesus walked out of the tomb. He was and is alive. In the power of God's holiness, grace, and love, God is God's presence. In the revelation of his love is his power. God revealed his power, his love. When he went to the cross and rose from the dead, when Jesus walked out of that tomb, he, he made one thing very clearly known, and that is this, that death is defeated. Death is swallowed up in victory. Death has lost its sting, and death has lost its strength. In Acts 2, we read this. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death. And this is my best part. I love this part. Because it was not possible that he should be held by it. The hand of death could not hold on. Now the question is, why was the tomb open? Did Jesus need the tomb open? Did Jesus need the stone rolled away? He did not need that rock removed. Did he need the angel to remove the rock for him? He's the creator of heaven and earth, the Lord God. The tomb was not open so he could walk out, but so we could walk in. It was open so his disciples could walk in and see it is empty. So the whole world could walk in and say, it is empty. There was no body there. In this Matthew passage, the angel told the women, that they were seeking Christ, but he was no longer there. He had risen. In Luke, we read, that was read earlier, it says, why do you seek the living among the dead? Why do you seek the living? Why do you seek Christ? He's not dead. He's not here. He is risen. When the women in search of Jesus, it was like Mary and Joseph searching for Jesus when he was 12 years old. 
in, in Jerusalem, having lost him. What did Jesus say to his parents? He said, why do you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Why do you seek Christ among the dead? Don't you know that Christ is about his father's business? Why do you seek Christ who is life among a place where only death is? Christ is about his father's business. He may have been brought here, but he can't stay. His body may have been placed in that tomb, but there was nothing there to keep him. That is why we say death does not get the final say. In 1 Peter, we read this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. I always think of that like the bank of heaven. When Christ died, it appeared final and forever. But then Sunday morning came, and the tomb doors blew open. And Christ walked out. Because he arose, what we have and what we have been given is uncorrupt- incorruptible, undefiled, does not fade away. It is permanent. It is forever. It is reserved for you, secured in the bank vault in heaven. You, it cannot be taken away. It cannot be stolen. It can't be misplaced. What Christ has accomplished was for you. The tomb door was open for you so that your sin and death and shame and hurt are gone. It was open so you could run into the Father's arms. The God of the universe thought of you. He sent his Son thinking of you. He called you to himself. The power displayed has proven Christ is Lord, for he is risen, and he has risen. Number two. Eyes and minds are opened. Let's go to Luke 24. Start with 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road? And while he opened the scriptures to us, so they arose up that very hour, returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together. So Sunday, the Sunday that Christ arose must have been a very strange day. The dread of knowing Christ was dead filled the minds and the hearts of the followers of Christ, the disciples. The future to them appeared, I imagine, very uncertain. The journey they were they had with Christ. It was over for all they knew. Nothing made sense. Jesus had made the statement that didn't make sense for him having to have died. Why did you die? The night before he was betrayed and arrested, Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. He said, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That really didn't look like you overcame anything, Jesus. You died. How could you have overcome anything? You you were betrayed. You were denied. You were arrested. You were mocked. You were crucified. You You didn't overcome anything. Now imagine the disciples as they watched their Lord die. They had given up their lives to follow him. They abandoned their jobs to follow him. Then to top it off, they were not only asso- they were now associated with a known criminal. They were guilty by association. Wouldn't all those who followed the crucified Lord be subject to the same conviction that they w- that he was? The disciples then did something that Well, it makes sense. They hid. The future was scary now. Maybe they could just sneak it, sink into the background, change their names, hide out in plain sight. The dread of what had happened became extremely personal. Then as Peter and the others are behind closed doors, some 
somewhat weary of going outside, some women came bursting through the doors speaking a mile a minute. They were probably saying something like this. We went to the tomb, and when we were there, the stone was, it was gone. And then this angel said he wasn't there, and they said to go tell you, and so here we are. What? In fact, in uh, Luke it says, and their words seem like to them idle tales, nonsense. What are you talking about? You're talking a mile in a minute. We saw Jesus die. We saw his lifeless body on the cross. He's dead. He cannot be alive. Peter, though, was intrigued. So he got up, and we find out in the book of John that John went with him, and we find out that John had to tell the world that he was faster than Peter for some reason. And they both ran to the tomb, and they looked in, and it was empty. What happened here? Could it be possible? Number one, surprised by God. We're surprised because we're not expecting what had happened could have happened. This is a different kind of surprise, though. Like if I hold a surprise party for you, that's okay because you know that I would have that ability to kind of do that maybe. But surprise because God did something that none of us could do. You can't make it up. You can't use mirrors and black drapes and say, oh, look, he's alive. God did the impossible, for that is what God does, the impossible. When the angel visited Mary to tell her she would give birth to Christ, he said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. He then went on to say to to her, nothing is impossible with God. It was impossible for us to bring Christ into the world, and it was impossible for us to bring Christ out of the grave. But with God, all things are possible. On the day Christ arose, there were two men traveling to a small town called Emmaus. As these two men walked, a third member somehow just joined them. They didn't know who he was. And and these men, of course, were talking about the events that had transpired, about Jesus having died. And the third member, of course, we know who is Christ, walking with them. They didn't recognize him. Why did they not recognize he was Christ? Because he was dead. (laughs) There is no way this could be Christ. I mean, he kind of looks familiar, but there's no way this is Christ. He's dead. Jesus asks what the two men are talking about. And the men are going, what? You didn't have, it was in all the headlines. Jesus died on the cross. You didn't catch that? So they told him, saying that Christ, who they thought would read, that Christ, you know, the Lord Jesus, was, they thought he was the one that was going to redeem Israel. But he was killed. They even said that the women found the tomb empty. It was a strange day. But this third member began to teach them. Then all of a sudden, this Jesus, who they don't think is Jesus, starts talking to them, saying, well, let me tell you what the scriptures say about Christ. How would he know? (laughs) And, I mean, he went through it all, Genesis all the way to Malachi, just going through it. That would have been an interesting, I would have loved to have a pen, you know, or maybe a computer, tablet, whatever. As they approached the town of Emmaus, though, Jesus looked like he was just going to keep going. They said, hey, stop. Let us stay with us. We're going to have dinner. So Christ sits down with them. And as he's sitting down, he breaks the bread. And they go, oh, and their eyes open. It's Jesus. It's the Lord. And he's gone. And so they run back to Jerusalem. This is seven miles, by the way. You know, it's a long ways. How far, Mark, is your house from here? About seven miles? So it'd be like ru- walking from Mark's house to here and then r- running all the way back to his house. Jesus is alive. You know, it's a lot of work. So they hurried back. And then they tell the people, they burst through the doors. <sighs> Jesus, hold on. Jesus is alive. And Peter says, I know. What? You know, at this time, Jesus was coming and going, and one day he appeared again in verse 44. Let's look at Luke 24, 44. It says, then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Their understanding was opened. 
And I think that's a prayer we want to pray. Lord, open my mind to see you, to understand your word. He opened their minds to understand the scripture. What was happening? This is what Christ does. This is what the Spirit does. He helped you see Christ alive. He opened your mind to see Christ in the word. Christ is the interpretation of the word. He is the means by which we understand God's heart. The Holy Spirit will open your mind. You will see Christ. You will know he is alive. You will see scripture. You will see Christ. Step out of these pages. Our minds are closed to the word of God until God opens our minds and our eyes. The Bible says the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so they, they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who's the image of God. The devil is closing eyes to not see the beauty of God's love and his grace. But God will open eyes. The Bible says about God, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are, as higher, are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We should expect God to do something that is beyond what we can imagine in a way that we would never fully understand. When we think of the power of God, we think of terms of how we would use it. Typically in a tyrannical manner. You give me power, I'll have tyranny. But God, who's rich in mercy, loves and uses his power. You know how he uses his power? He loves us. He gives. Christ dying on the cross and rising again is a strategy where God again proved his love. He proved his character. He proved his heart. We need our eyes opened so we too can see the risen Christ and understand his amazing words. Know this and declare this. He is risen. Number three, God's arms are open. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I think I grabbed my uh, NASB Bible, not my New King James, so oh well. <laughs> Christ arose, meaning the death he died had a purpose. Christ died for a reason. Why would a man who was so thoroughly mocked, bullied, humiliated, and killed be alive today? Because he had a purpose for his death. In Colossians, we read this. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. That's what Christ did when he rose from the dead. Christ arose to triumph over his enemies. Who are his enemies? Death, disease, and hell. We're told in 1 Corinthians, for he must reign till he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Death. Christ arose, meaning he is the resurrection and the life. When Christ arose, the disciples were truly blessed and happy. But the question you have to ask, and, what, and I wonder if they did ask this, is, well, now what do we do? And Christ was ready to give the marching orders. Number one, and this is the most uh, beautiful truth, Christ has all authority. Basi because he arose, Christ has proven he is Lord. All authority belongs to Christ. What does that mean? It means the devil doesn't have any. It means the world doesn't have any. It means we do not have the authority within us. I have no authority within me. When I preach Christ, that's authority. When I speak the name of Jesus, that's authority. Nobody needs to know my name. Let them know uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let them know that name. His name has authority. Authority comes from him, not me, not society, not politics, not religion, he has all authority. What does Christ want to accomplish with his authority? In 28, he says, go therefore and make disciples of a few people. Of all nations. He wants the world, all the nations, to know him, to know God. He wants the world to know that God's arms are open wide, ready to come to him. He wants the world to know that he loves them with a love that is everlasting and true. He wants the world... 
that God, he wants the world to know that God wants to forgive them of all their sins, to heal them of all their pain, to lift up their pain, to strengthen them in faith, to build them up, to call them to serve, to sanctify, justify, glorify. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. Christ is for the whole world. He is for the person in Russia, Tajikistan, China, Indonesia, Japan, Mexico, Paraguay, Canada, United States, France, Romania, Turkey, Iraq, etc., etc., etc. Every person in every home. He's for the whole world. Every person who is alive has the same problem, sin. And every person has the same solution, Jesus Christ. Let us make sure every person has the same opportunity to hear the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to know the name and to live in the reality of his promise that he is alive. As Christ stood on the mountain in Galilee telling his disciples to go and make disciples, he was telling them the hope the resurrected Christ is to be given to every person so they could know the beauty of God's grace. Since Christ has triumphed over his enemies, let us walk with confidence into the battlefield of those lost and say to the world, He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us pray. Father God, you are for the whole world, and we want everyone to know you, to love you, to exalt you. I would like everyone in this room to know you deeply, fully, completely. Everyone in this building, whether they're helping in children's church or other things, Lord, I pray that you, they would know you, they would exalt you, they would submit to you. I pray for this whole town, Lord, that this town would know you. I pray 1,500 people come to know Christ to overcome the blindness of the enemy. But we, you know, we know you have all authority, Lord. So I pray that your name would be made known. I pray Christ's name would be made known.